Welcome to episode 37 of the Serious About Security podcast for April 29th, 2013, brought to you by the Center for Education and Research and Information Assurance and Security, or Sirius, at Purdue University. I'm Preston Wiley, and I'm joined today by Keith Watson and Mike Hill, and I think Josh Gillum might join us uh, later if he can get his uh, his uh, hangout thing working. Um, and uh, Keith has today's uh, article. Right. And so last week, uh, Verizon uh, released what's known as the Data Breach Investigations Report for 2013. Basically, it's kind of a recap of their findings and information submitted to them via, via a variety of agencies about uh, computer and internet related attacks and compromises and crimes and a whole sort of different interesting things going on um, in the world of information security. And so this report's fairly long. It's about 63 pages, and it's uh, available for you to download, and we'll have the link in the show notes. If Most people uh, have probably heard about this already and probably have already downloaded it, but uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about that today. Um, you know, I would say there's a lot of new information here, but they've been doing these data, be data breach investigation reports for so many years. You know, it's hard to say that there's significant change over their findings from previous years. There's a few things which we'll probably talk about as we go along, but um, it's more interesting from the perspective of this gives us some idea of what's going on in, in the world of compromised systems, attackers, where they come from, what they're targeting, uh, damages associated with some of those attacks. And this is just one of several reports that typically come out over the year and um, thought it was a good thing to talk about today. So uh, one thing that, uh, that I thought we'd talk about is basically the vectors that uh, a lot of these attacks are using. And I'm trying to scroll back to the part that talks a little bit about that. but. There are a variety of vectors, typically. There's, there's attacking servers, there's attacking users through social means, there's malicious software involved, there's um, you know, direct install of you know, malicious uh, software, there's email attachments that people op uh, uh, open, there's you know, browsing to certain websites that get stuff installed, uh, email links, of course, and then a variety of other methods and then how they use that, what, what information they capture once they have a foothold on a machine and some of that's covered as well. There's also some discussion on you know, physical attacks which usually we don't see a lot of let's say but it seems that one seems to have gone up in the past year. If we look at 2008, 2009, they were around, you know, the 12 to 15 percent range of attacks uh, in terms of action, uh, threat actions, and then 2010 jumps to 29 percent physical attacks do, but 2011 drops back to 10, and now in 2012 we're up to 35 percent of attacks. So th that's an interesting sort of thing, um, which I noted here in, in the threat actions. Another, another you know, thing that's gone down actually compared to 2011 were hacking based attacks. They're listed at 52% for 2012 and malware has also dropped a little bit from 69% to 40%. So, you know, there's some changes in terms of the methods that attackers are using. Um, and so, you know, it's just one of, inter one of the interesting things uh, to talk about today. You guys want to throw in any other quick comments on what you saw that was interesting? Well, according to the report, uh, from what I read, the physical stuff was pretty much skimming devices in retail stores from, from an ATM. Retail stores and ATMs is the main physical uh, component there, but I think the I think the physical stuff and the social stuff kind of lowered the percentages for the malware and hacking. So while it's percentage-wise they went down. I'm not so sure if 
they actually went down, you know, on the number of, of occurrences. I just think the other two kind of lowered the hacking and malware percentages. So I think that might be a little bit deceptive to say that there was a decrease. There was a decrease in the percentage, but that's because two other categories took up a higher percentage of the overall uh, um, incidences. Right. Yeah. It, there, there are changes in percentages, but not necessarily in the total numbers. I totally agree. And that's one interesting aspect because then the question becomes, you know, related to their methodology and how much data they actually collected. Yeah. You know, typically, uh, in the past, we we haven't had a lot of data to look at. A lot of corporations involved typically do not release a lot of their numbers. They're either afraid of how their stock my price might be affected due to investor confidence, that sort of thing. Or they might uh, have other issues or they don't want to share anything to that might be shown as a weakness. Um, so the amount of information available to generate reports like this has always been a little limited. And there isn't a real requirement uh, in the law that says if you have a compromise that you need to report it. There are in some industries that are regulated, uh, healthcare being a good example of that, but less so in other industries. So, so we don't have a great deal of information about what is actually happening. So when anytime we get information, you know, you always got to say, oh, is this, is this a trend of something interesting or is this only reflected in the data that we have access to? Well, well, one more thing that I wanted to comment on is there's really two two categories <coughs> of, uh, of of essentially motivations for these breaches. I mean, there's really there's there's more than two, but there's two major ones. The first is financial gain, and the second one is espionage. And uh, as far as financial gain goes, I think that's Take, that takes place by from or, a majority of organized crime organizations, and uh, it, it, according to the report, it hit retail, uh, a significant amount of retail, food service, information, and finance, finance um, sectors. Um, and I'm guessing a lot of those, a lot of those were physical skimming devices as well as hacking, and the espionage targeted manufacturing and transportation for the most part and I think uh, I think what was it 96 percent of all of those were originated from China which I think are in some interesting uh, numbers yeah we we've heard a lot about China in the in the past uh, year um, and this this report either is confirmation of that or people and industries and, and investigators are focusing more on that. I, I don't know if this is a problem of confirmation bias. You know, we feel that China is causing this problem and look, oh, here's data that confirms that. Or if it's a sign of, a, of another issue or they're actually, you know, launching more attacks or probing deeper into these industries and governments. It's not, not quite clear yet. And the and the other thing is is China's primary motiva motivation is to steal information, while the rest of the world's primary motivation it seems is to steal money. So it's, they have different goals. China has completely yeah, different that, goals. Yeah, that's that's completely true. Yes, totally. Well, part of what makes it difficult to uh, understand in this report is a lot of the charts just talk about the 621 confirmed uh, data disclosures. Uh, but they also took a total of 47,000 plus security incidents. Uh, so to kind of highlight how those differences are, uh, Keith, you were talking about the threat action categories, uh, which is something I found interesting as well. Uh, but the chart I found interesting was the one that looked across all the security incidents. And it really changes the numbers when you look at it that way because almost half, 48% of the incidents were just tied to error. Um, across all the security incidents. So um, I, in some ways I find it, you know, really difficult to kind of read between the lines on this 
because when I see a figure like that that goes against all the incidents, uh, that tells me we still need to do a better job of security awareness, that these little errors that happen every day, um, you know, the, the weak passwords, the clicking on the links in the emails, that's still the major vector. That's how people are being compromised. Um, while there's still a lot of active malware and hacking, um, I, I still think, you know, this highlights, you know, uh, error and, and misuse was another 20%. So nearly 70% of all of these incidents are, are tied to one of those two categories. Yep, that's, um, that is a good point. And, you know, there's so much data here. It's hard to look through this and, and say, ah, well, clearly we have to do A better or B better or we don't even need to bother with C because that's not helping us. It's not exactly obvious how to take this information and apply it. Um, in fact, if you look at the conclusion of the report, and I'm going to skip back down to it real quick, in the conclusion they talk about uh, kind of like recommendations, conclusions and recommendations. And you know, you read through a little summary and, and then the next page they list the 20 critical security controls. Same stuff that we've talked about for a long time. It's the SANS 20, you know, top 20 critical controls. So, you know, and that's, you know, to, and not to say that these aren't, you know, you do these 20 items and you're going to be completely fine. These are big items, right? Um, and yeah, any security organization that can actually do all 20 has enough people to do it, has enough support for management to do all that, sure, they would be in a category that would make them pretty hard to compromise. Not impossible, but pretty hard. So I didn't feel like their their conclusion said, oh yeah, just do A, B, C, and D, and you'll be fine. No, they point to common guidance that we've had for a long time, top 20 security, critical security controls. So, so, so would you say that, disappointing. <laughs> yeah, would you say that we've known for a long time what we need to do that we just don't know how to do it then? Is that kind of what you know a general conclusion uh, is? <laughs> I, I don't know. I think we know how to do most all of this stuff from an industry point of view. We, we know how to do all of this. The problem is the cost, the, the amount of qualified professionals that help implement this stuff, the, the, the qualified leaders that are actually going to you know form teams and make this stuff come about and management support. That's probably the key. If you don't have that, how are you going to get the right leader in place? How are you going to get the right money? How are you going to hire the right qualified individuals to go and do these 20 controls? So, you know, you could take that and say, well, you know, okay, you got these 20 controls. We know how to do all of them. The problem is we don't have the people to do all of them. Um, is that a matter of uh, we just don't have enough qualified people out there? We believe is a problem, uh, or is it just lack of support from uh, company or organizational management? Uh, support from, uh, hey, go out and do this and make it the best thing you can, and here's some money to make it happen, or is it something else? Uh, I think they're, you know, you know, while their data was interesting, their recommendations were less interesting. Um, the problem is, yeah, if you did all 20 of these controls, you'd probably be in pretty good shape, but that's not the easiest thing to do. If they prioritized them and said, of the 20 controls, do these top five first, that might have been more helpful. Well, <clears throat> speaking of that, one of the things that they did mention was two-factor authentication, or rather, they didn't mention two-factor authentication directly. They mentioned a replacement for single-factor authentication. Um, i.e. passwords um, would have uh, mitigated 80% uh, of the breaches um, that they saw. So uh, I think that is a pretty, I, th I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good um, indication that, that that would have been a very good thing for an organization to focus on using two-factor authentication or replacement for passwords um, because, you know, you click a you click a phishing link, you enter your password, they get in. Two-factor authentication, you do that. Eh, eh, they have they have one factor, but unless you say, "Hey, you should email us your phone so that we can fix it," and then, <laughs> then you know, I, I don't think that's going to happen. So, so um, 
I think that that was one thing that one mitigation control that I saw that I think uh, they they mentioned earlier that I think would would have helped a lot. Yeah, there are. You know, there's some information here that that could be actionable, but most I think you're going to read through it and go, "Wow, we have some serious problems here." which is usually what you do when you read security reports like this like oh man there's a lot to worry about out there in the world you know it's not a safe place uh, hopefully this could be used to convince or you could use something like this or the data from it to convince you know management to say look this is a serious problem there are others in our industry that are suffering breaches and while we may not have anything you know, that's been a super high uh, incident, let's say, you know, that had a high impact, we are not alone and we are also probably being targeted. So this could be information that could be helpful in putting, neg putting together a case for increasing funding or hiring more people to help, you know, m help manage and prevent some of these attacks. Yeah, one statistic I'm... Um trying to understand a little bit better is on page 47 the uh, they, they show the data records compromised over the years uh, starting back in 2004 and the numbers just kind of jump all over the place um, and, and like last uh, the 2011 report had a uh, 174 million and then this year we have uh, 44 th 44 million eight hundred thousand so um, and they note in the report that you know this is really just sort of a, you know, they, they only know a, a portion of the total data breaches. Uh, something like 85% of the extent is truly not known. So, you know, I, I look at that and I'm trying to understand, are, you know, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? I mean, what can we really learn from, from this data? Uh, because 44 million um, doesn't seem that high, you know, in light of uh, breaches we've heard of recently. I mean, like the living social breach just announced earlier, you know, something like 55 million passwords. Uh, I mean, do those kinds of breaches figure into this report, or is it just those specific, you know, is it just specific incidents that get included? I think it's probably incidents that are part of the data set that they're examining. I think it says that somewhere. I don't think they bring in data that's not something that they have a record for. I, I actually think they do. I think they might bring in data they don't have a record before for. Oh, okay. I think, I think they might pull from other sources as well um, and include some high profile incidences in addition to uh, to that. But they have a lot of partners if you look. So um, they, they, they would get a lot of data including the Secret Service, um, CERT, um, and quite a few other organizations. So um, I'm guessing especially the living social uh, breach will probably be included in next year's report. So we've already, we're at the end of April and we've already exceeded the number of uh, records, I think, from all of last year. Yeah, if you could count that, you would definitely surpass last year. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and they, they do note that most of these breaches go back to just a very few large data breaches. So it's not that it's made up of, of several small data breaches, but it sounds like it's made up of very few large data breaches, which I guess the Living Social will fit into nicely next year. <laughs> you know, another interesting um, little stat here is related to attacks and targeting. And they have two categories for that. There's opportunistic and there's targeted, where you're actually, somebody's actually going after you specifically. And the numbers are roughly, overall, 75% of those attacks are opportunistic. And that might mean an attacker found through, you know, scanning a large number of networks, found opportunities in the, in the types of uh, open systems or vulnerabilities or what have you and exploited those versus the targeted attack where you're actually somebody's actually going after you specifically because of what you do or what information you might have and it's interesting because in the targeted 
and this should be obvious, but in the targeted attacks, a majority of those are related to espionage. And very little of that is financial. But in the opportunistic type of attack, it's mostly financial. So I thought that was, you know, pretty obvious, you know, from a, you know, if you think about it, perspective. But they actually have some data that kind of confirms that. It's kind of interesting. Well, Josh uh, po has been posting in the chat quite a bit, and he mentioned uh, from page 19, the threat actor from internal sources has been reducing and is curious what is causing that. Um, he says his first thought was more segregation of duty, either from proper alignment or is it just because businesses were getting bigger and need more additional IT personnel, so separation of duty is just a byproduct. So um, I, I, I do have a comment on that. One, one of the, from the internal uh, threat sources, um, a majority of those seem to be cashiers. Um, so that would probably would be cashiers stealing credit card numbers is my guess. And um, my guess is that has, I, I'm, I'm guessing that has gotten more difficult or people have been more aware of it. And I'm I'm hoping organizations have taken made controls to prevent that from happening, um, either putting things in a more public way, public uh, environment, so that cashiers have uh, less the uh, less ability to to gather these credit card numbers or or whatever. So I I don't know. That's that's the question that Josh asked: is what is causing internal sources to be to reduce over the years? Well, I think you have a good point, Preston, about the cashier. Uh, just to use that as an example, um, I know a lot of places now you scan your own card. You, you keep control of your card during the entire transaction. So you scan it at the point of sale. You en if you need to, you enter your PIN separately. And the cashier doesn't ever physically handle your card. So it, it stays in your possession the entire time. So I think that might be one way organizations are helping drive that down. Because if they don't get a hold of it, they can't they can't copy it down themselves. Well, minus your credit card skimmers, which are on those devices that that you swipe your card through. Well, I don't think that counts as an internal uh, source. Not. I think that would yeah. count as an external. No, you're, so. you're right. You're right. <laughs> yeah, you're just nothing. You just got nothing you can do about that. Just try to look, and I think those things are very hard to detect. But yeah, I think that would be external, not internal. Well, I think another interesting point is in the internal actors, one of them is an end user, and I'm not quite sure what that means. I don't know if that means the user of a service who also breaks into said service and does something bad to it, or what they're referring to as far as end user goes when it comes to internal actors. That's okay. A question. Don't yeah. Know. Well, I I don't know. So anyway, um, I think Josh also pointed out that, uh, and I I saw this as well, is that the probability in an email campaign, and they have a chart in there, that uh, a, as you as you reach uh, twenty emails in a in a in a phishing email campaign, I think at twenty you're guaranteed at one hundred percent that somebody will click. There, you'll get at least one click in a phishing campaign. Now, um, as they point out with that chart, with phishing campaigns, there's a lot of ands associated with these clicks. I mean, there has to be a vulnerability. There has to be uh, <clears throat> some information that you need to get. You know, there's a lot of ands as far as phishing goes, which reduces the number even more because if the person who clicks the email is not vulnerable to the attack, then nothing's going to happen. So I, I thought that was interesting that, you know, it, it only takes 20, 20 emails to guarantee, essentially guarantee a click. I thought we were educating users a bit better than that. Well, if you look at the numbers, it at three, you get a 50% chance. That's a more striking number. 20 at 100%, sure. But if it only takes three and you get half the people to do it, that's a little more interesting. 
and usually if you look at spam messages, you know this the success rate on spam is pretty low for people clicking on a spam message. Um, but three targeted emails is a fifty percent chance. Well, even at one, at one you're just over twenty percent. That's higher than spam. <laughs> a lot higher. That's like less than one percent. So that's some pretty good. That's some pretty good uh, spam or phishing emails, I guess. Pretty convincing. Yeah, it's a pretty alarming statistic. Um, I think it just points out again. I, I think the challenges remain in in education. You know. Uh, sp spreading the word, educating users on not to do those things. Um, I just, I don't know, I, I'm looking at that chart just trying to really understand it. I, I guess it's just the way it's written. To me, it almost sounds like if I sent 20 emails, 100% of an organization would be vulnerable. And we know that's not true. We know that's not accurate. So I guess it's saying if I send 20 emails, I have a 100% chance of getting one person to, to click it back, um, which I guess is probably more likely how, how it's how it's written to be that over the course of 20 targeted emails I'll get at least one person to respond. Um, I've got a hundred percent chance of getting some one person to, to click on it. Well then Mike I guess the question would be is is security awareness programs the actual right way to do this or is there more of a technical solution that needs to be considered? Well you know I or think both. I, I think it, I think it is both. I think um, I think security awareness with no follow-up is uh, it won't do much. I, I think we need um, we need to be testing our, our own employees. We, we need to have a follow-up and not an announced follow-up, but we need to try to trick them and, and not to punish them or embarrass them, uh, but just to know about our own organization. How many people would click on this email if I constructed one that looked uh, like it was fairly legitimate but came from an external source with a link that was cryptic and, and would go to a site and somehow I can measure back and know how many people are clicking on that and then I would know you know what I need to run my training and awareness program uh, every couple months because these numbers are going up you know people are, are falling more victim to it I, I just think it's one of those things I think it's theory, uh, theory versus practice you know theoretically we can teach people about this, but till, until they experience it and see what it actually looks like, I think they just sort of put it in the category of, oh, I, I, I'm a smart user. I know not to click on. I know which links to click on and which ones not to click on. Um, well, so I think we need true, to but keep in mind that some of uh, some of the attacks we talked about in the past have been related to even smart security people who should know better got a targeted email from an email address that appeared to be a customer or a client or a partner or something like that and it had an attachment saying oh yeah remember that call we had last week here's the document you asked me to send you even smart people fall for that one and even people who should know better might click on something so I'm not convinced that security awareness is is a, a big help it is a help. I, yeah, it's not I, a big I, help. If you don't have a technical solution that says, well, you clicked on that and you probably shouldn't because of this, this, and this, or at least a, a system that's secure enough that those vulnerabilities are not something that can be exploited, assuming not zero days, then, you know, that's, we're always going to have that problem. Well, yeah, I, I agree. agree. My point. Yeah, I, I think, um, I wasn't implying that, uh, uh, only the, the non-educated users would do it. I think a lot of people do it, and I think you probably would find probably a, a striking number of security professionals that would probably do it because I think we might be some of the worst offenders in some ways because we we think we know better, and we we see an email, and we we see it's from someone in our trusted book. We say, okay, I, I you know I maybe I'm not following up on all the little things that. We, we talk about in these programs. But, but yeah, that, that's what I'm saying. You gotta have some follow-up that says people are clicking on these links. You know, construct some things and, and let people kind of experience it and then you can see how effective it is. You know, because it's one thing to talk about it in a class or online training. It's another to kind of experience it and have someone come back and say, well do you know why, you know, do we know why this email worked? Why people were, were willing to click on it? Well, I uh, the a lot of these emails, I, I'll say, have looked 
pretty legitimate. I mean, they're they're getting pretty good at faking this. And and I'll I'll, have, I'll say something not related to email, but I I I'll tell you a story about how I was tricked <laughs> once. Um, it had to do with it wasn't an email, but it was a, a, a I think a piece of malware on a website that gave this thing that was an Adobe. We need to update your Adobe Flash Player. You know, it popped up the little dialogue, the little little window that says we need to, and it looks exactly like the and you know Adobe Flash Player updates all the freaking time. So you click the button, it's like I need your administrator privileges which Adobe Flash Player does, and it said it was signed by Adobe Flash. I mean, it says, I, I, don't, I don't know how, how they were able to fake that, but, uh, but uh, they did, and uh, I pretty much after I did that, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, bad stuff is happening. So, you know, it's an example of, you know, security education or anything like that would not have... Have uh, have uh, have done anything to to uh, help with that? I clicked it because it was uh, it was it was this is how this is how Adobe Flash works, and whoever did this knew how Adobe Flash worked and made it look exactly like Adobe Flash was trying to update. And until you you finished, until you, the 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 biggest thing that that made it not work was that I realized. What it was doing after I after I did what I did, so it, it wasn't very good at essentially hiding itself from, which I think is a flaw in in the in the malware that was running is that it didn't hide itself. It made itself completely obvious that something bad was happening, and I, I was able to essentially stop it. But um, they're getting very good at doing this sort of thing, and I think Adobe uh, has maybe mitigated it a little bit. They have auto updating so you don't have to get you don't get all these dialogues and stuff. But but back then when I, when it when it happened, it was it was every it seemed like every two weeks Adobe was updating their software. So right. it wasn't unusual to see these windows pop up and have to install Adobe. True. And I, I think if you if you look at some of the more professional looking emails I mean Eng you know uh, emails where they write something that has a pretty convincing argument and they use good English and per and proper grammar uh, those could fool a lot of people I mean I don't get a lot of sp I get a lot of spam messages that with, with really poor English and really bad grammar and so those are pretty obvious but if I sat down and wrote a fairly convincing email and wrote it in the style and in the manner of the person that I was pretending to be, you would have a hard time knowing well, what was legit or not. Absolutely. And just one other point I'd like to make, just you know, a little variant on it is, an organization that goes through all the security awareness and says, don't click on links, you know, don't provide your password and emails and, and everything, they should have that same security posture. Um, so they say never click on a link in an email. They should not send me an official email with a link in it because they've just told me not to trust links and emails. So why should I click on it? So I think that's another thing organizations need to look at is upholding the security posture that they're trying to enforce. <laughs> yes, obviously that would be helpful. And yes. not sending attachments, that might be the other thing. True, true. <laughs> Well, we probably kicked this subject uh, <laughs> down the road quite a bit. Uh, so why don't we wrap up here, and we'll just say uh, it's interesting reading. Take it with a grain of salt. Uh, corroborate anything you find there with other reports, and uh, keep your system secure and uh, whatever. <laughs> All right, well, I will wrap it up. Uh, thanks to Mike Hill, Keith Watson, and Josh Gillum. I'm Preston Wiley. Have a safe and secure day. <laughs>